the thing that we get to do in martial arts is we get to be that that life coach for every single person that walks through our doors. We get to pour into them. We get to tell them that we believe in them, that we see potential in what they could be. And I think that's invaluable. Every person needs someone that believes in them and, and verbally recognizes that, right? I, I see your value and you have amazing potential and I'm here to help you achieve whatever your goals are. Hello, this is James Cox with the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast. I have a special guest with me today in episode number 60, 60. This is Travis Thornton. He's in the Delaware area. And man, Travis is a, a very educated guy on the martial arts, the business, the coaching. I've, I've seen you through the years. I've been really impressed with, with your growth. Uh, Mr. Travis, why don't you kind of introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your journey from where you are. Yeah, absolutely. So Mr. Cox, appreciate the opportunity to come on here. Um, it's an honor. Um, yeah, I started martial arts when I was 11 years old. I started in a Taekwondo or Tong Sudo Academy. Um, I always wanted to do martial arts even younger than that, but it was not a studio in my town. And we moved to uh, another small town called Brunswick, Georgia. Um, my grandfather owned a, a mall there that all my family worked inside of. And sure enough, a martial arts school popped up inside the mall. And that was the perfect opportunity for me to jump in and start taking lessons. Um, I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle, man. I wanted to be Raphael with the attitude, you know, like, like I just loved it. And uh, my mom signed me up for martial arts lessons and, and I never looked back. I mean, I was down there every single day, started in, of course, like a basic program moved to black belt training or a black belt club back then, uh, right into teaching when I was 15 or 16. Um, got really heavy into Taekwondo competitions, the US, uh, USTU and the AAU. Uh, I wanted to be an Olympic athlete. I looked up to Steven Lopez and wanted to be you know, on the Olympic team. Uh, best I ever got was fifth in the nation. Um, started getting injured quite a bit around that, that 15, 16 year old time period, blew my knee out, blew my back out. And that kind of made me decide, you know what, maybe that's not the route I want to take. Let me really focus on giving back, you know, and teaching martial arts. I loved helping others. Started teaching martial arts. Um, that's really was my job. It was my first job and never stopped it. My instructor ended up moving on and, and he went into real estate. Uh, he, he, was, he was teaching for another owner's studio. And so when he moved on, I took over um, and then eventually opened my own academy and independent studio in 2005. And, um, and honestly, I have, haven't stopped doing martial arts since. It's always been an integral part of my life. And um, I love it. I love everything yeah. about martial arts. I love how it helps people. I love the confidence it gives children because it definitely helped me in that area. I was very athletic as a kid, but lacked a lot of confidence. I was an only child, freckles, big ears. I finally grew into my ears, I think. <laughs> and, and, and so the, the confidence that martial arts gave me was invaluable. I actually broke my grandparents' heart. I was supposed to be a major league baseball player growing up. That That's what I was supposed to be. And when I was in high school, I told them I was going to focus on martial arts and that career versus baseball. So that was a hard conversation with my family, but I think I made the right decision. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you did. I mean, that's awesome. You know, we have similar stories uh, with that that beginning and the age and, and what it did and the confidence. And just people just don't really know. You don't know until you know, right? So all these years of, of your training, you know, the confidence and, and what, what else have you really seen it do for you, you know, personally? Well, I mean, going back to the confidence in baseball, like when I was in first grade, I had a school teacher, you know, you were supposed to write what your dream was or what you wanted to be when you grew up. Right. And of course, I wanted to be an Atlanta Braves baseball player. That was my goal. Dale Murphy was my idol. And um, and I literally had this teacher in, in first grade tell me that I probably need to think about a plan B because because only like one percent of baseball players actually make it. And you know what? I think honestly that stuck in my brain and planted a seed and later on when things got tough in baseball and things of that nature. And I, you know, sometimes you can get overlooked in, in team sports. You know, you might be a great player because you don't have connections or this or that. You don't get the position on the team. And and that happened to me. And I think if, if I had somebody that believed in me, if somebody told me, yeah, you could do that, right? I probably would have stuck it out and pushed through that ad, you know, adversity. But because that teacher told me back in first grade, I probably need to think about a plan B. I stopped baseball, honestly. And I think that's probably because of that seed that she planted. And the thing that we get to do in martial arts is we get to be that, that life coach for every single person that walks through our doors. We get to pour into them. We get to tell them that we believe in them, that we see potential in what they could be. And I think that's invaluable. Every person needs someone that believes in them 
and, and verbally recognizes that, right? I, I see your value and you have amazing potential and I'm here to help you achieve whatever your goals are. And um, I think that's what that I got out of martial arts and why I decided to stick to that because my instructor poured into me and made me such a, a big part of that studio. And, and even after he left, you know, I continued my martial arts journey. I got heavily involved in boxing and kickboxing through the IKF. Uh, my son fought at the Worlds and he got second at Worlds. We never did win Worlds, but we got close, um, you know, and I, I poured that same kind of passion into every student, including my own children that I, I got from martial arts. And so knowing that one word that you can say to a child could affect the rest of their life, like I'm yeah. very careful with the way that I speak to kids on and off my mat. I push them, man, I grind on them, but I also... I always say it's like you got to have a good yin and yang, right? You got to be hard, but you also have that soft side and you got to love on your students, right? And that's what I try to train my instructors to do. Like, have your expectations. Be hard on these kids. They need it. They crave it. They need the discipline. The parents want you to have that discipline with their children, but they also have to know that you care about them and that you see value in them. And um, that's the platform we have doing what we do. And it's just no better platform, I don't feel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love the word you said a couple of times, value. You know, when we think about that and it is crazy how uh, it makes me think of that, the, the, the book, The Four Agreements, you know, how one thing can be said and now that's marked. And we want to hope that it's for a positive, even if it's if it's realistic. But, hey, you, you might not be the next LeBron James, you know, um, but 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 somebody to say something to motivate you are the same way to encourage you. And hopefully it's not something that's. You know, because kids hear so so much negativity in the world on the daily. I mean, so much, man. So that they don't hear so much negativity, and then they're marked where they believe that, and they believe that they're a failure, and they believe that they don't have a future. They believe that they're fat and ugly and dumb, you know, when people are told these things. And we do have to be hard on the students. Sometimes I'm guilty maybe of sometimes being too hard. It's that tough love and how I came up. But we praise correct praise, right? Right. Yes, sir. You know, I, you know, I think I think we are hard. But again, it goes back to a good parent is going to discipline their child, but then hug them and love. them. Right. That, yeah. That's what a good parent does. And so that's what an instructor should be. You know, yeah. I hold you to a certain standard and I'm going to demand that that performance. And, and if you make mistakes, I'm going to hold you. You're going to be you know, consequences are going to be had because you made a mistake. But I'm going to love you and I'm going to tell you how much I, I appreciate you and I value you. Um, and that's really what kids crave, you know, uh, I, I actually purchased a studio up here in Delaware about a year ago now. And, and that was one thing that was missing in this culture was there wasn't much of a standard and expectation. And so when I came in and I really laid the law on those standards, you know, at first some parents were kind of taken back, like, oh my gosh, you know, what in the world is this, you know? But then I, I tell you every single day I had a parent come up to me and thank me, shake my hand say like this is what we we were thinking martial arts is all about and this is what we want for our child and so yeah. so it's needed in our culture you know like like nowadays adversity and struggle and failure seem to be like bad words you know like everybody wins you know give you a sticker give you a trophy mm -hmm. you know like I, I feel like that competition is, is is lacking in our society right now like like kids need to fail you need to get on the bike and fall off you know it's just yeah. you, you have to and uh, and I think we need to hold our kids to a higher standard. Um, and honestly, that's that's why I actually pulled my kids out of public school. We homeschool our children now uh, because I think they were getting miseducated in the public school system. You know, I think they were just a number. And I think the environment they're in and the influence that was around them was not teaching them the values that my wife and I want our, my, our kids to know. So we're going to control that, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know you're right. Tell me a little bit more about the value of the martial arts, because, you know, I don't get it as much. You know, this is 2023, but uh, and you own and operate martial arts schools. Man, you stepped into coaching, doing school evaluations and speaking and, and um, really getting out there. And that's good because why not share information if you can help someone else? You know, the things that you were saying about what that teacher said or what this parent should be, because what if tomorrow that parent is gone? What if tomorrow that teacher is gone? Were they able to leave a mark? Were they able to do something there? Um, you know, but there's a difference. I guess we talk value, and it's not it's not about money. But you know, uh, do you charge twenty five dollars a month for martial arts? Do you charge one hundred and seventy five dollars for martial arts? And how do you uh, justify, you know, value of martial arts? 
I went into a Five Guys the other day, had a burger, uh, order small order of fries and a bottle of water, and it was twenty three dollars. Uh, um, wow. I was in Boston recently, and I went and bought for the first time. Never had a lobster roll like a Boston lobster roll, and it was thirty one dollars for one sandwich. You know, and and that just hit me at that moment that like we we undervalue what we deliver in the martial arts industry, and probably in a lot of services that actually pour into children and do a great job serving families um, because of the impact, the lasting impact, the permanent impact that we can make. You know, that that temporary pleasure I got or that temporary relief from hunger that I got when I ate that burger, it is, it's temporary, you know, but but changing someone's life, like, like giving them confidence so that way they're not afraid to raise their hand when they have a question in school or not afraid to try new things is invaluable. Um, and so I think we all undercharge, you know, I mean, I heard the other day that um, one of the swim schools, you know, you come to one one swim lesson per week. I think it was called Goldfish or something. They charge two hundred dollars per month for one swim lesson per week. Whoa. And they have eight hundred members in that. Whoa. Eight hundred. Right. Hey, let's I mean, open I, some man, swim schools. <laughs> right. Like like wouldn't we like to have eight hundred members paying a minimum of two hundred dollars a month? You know, but why do parents see value in that? We pay that price but they complain about price. We want to charge $200 a month for martial arts lessons. It's because they don't understand. I don't think the value, I don't think we do a great job of actually showing the value or explaining the value up front with parents because the reason a parent will pay that is because fear, right? I don't want my child to drown. And so that problem is, is valuable for that parent to solve, right? Even if they know their kid can swim, it's still a fear that every mother has, even if they know their child swims well, like their eyes are on their kid if they're ever swimming, right? And so that, that it's a, it's a it's obvious problem that a swim school is, is solving, obvious. I don't want my kid to drown, big problem, right? I don't think it's as obvious in the martial arts field exactly what we do. I still feel like a lot of people think it's just self-defense, which is important, but we're not fighting for our lives every day of the week, right? Very rare. I don't think they understand the personal development that we truly teach in the martial arts. They think it maybe is just punching and kicking still, you know, and then, and then you go and you see a martial arts school inside of a YWCA and nothing against those guys. They may be teaching awesome martial arts and personal development, but when they charge something like $50 a month, it really devalues everything that we all do. You know, they don't understand the difference between you and I, James, that this is our career. This is all we do. This is our focus day in and day out the you know the commitment that we've made you know to our staff to our community to man just paying the bills you know like yeah. like this is our livelihood you know um and so i don't i don't think they quite 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 get it and one thing that i'm teaching my my program directors my sales people is how to really fact find like deep dive when somebody comes in our studio why today why is it important for you to get your child started with our program now and when you dig deep when the mom says it's confidence, well, tell me about that. Tell me about a time recently that he struggled with confidence. If we don't solve that problem, how could that affect the rest of his life? And when you really dig down, I've literally had parents cry on me in the middle of a sales conference, right. you know, trying to get their child signed up because I dug so deep and it got so personal. I'll even ask the mom, well, mom, did you struggle with confidence as a child? Because that's really what parents fear, right? I want my child to have it better than I have. Mm -hmm. So if I struggle with confidence, I don't want my kid to struggle with confidence. You know, if it's focus, maybe as a parent, I struggled with focus when I was young and I knew how it affected me. I don't want that for my child. And so I think if we do a better job in martial arts industry, really understanding that and, and selling, I say selling, it's not a bad word, but selling the problem that we're solving. If we do a better job of that, it increases the value of, of what we're doing on the map. And now we have to follow up on that. We have to live, deliver amazing benefit driven classes. And we have to, every single class, resell our value on the mat. You know, it can't be just, you know, hey, you punch a kick on our mat and you go home. You know, we need to, we need to have a personal relationship with every single parent and family child that, that comes in our doors and know what they're dealing with on a daily level. No, that's true, man. Um... So it's, it's like that, that the value is so much more, you know, we might say yeah, it's a lot more than kicking and punching here and then blah, blah, but that didn't say enough. You know, it's a lot more than kicking and punching. Okay. So what is it? And, uh, that, that deeper why, right? What about coaching, um, school evaluations? Cause 
man, not schools don't know. A lot of schools don't know this. And a lot of schools, I mean, let's, I mean, are they doing things wrong? Or are they just doing what they know? They only know what they know. Because there's some good martial artists out there, um, not always good instructors, and even the other way around. And there are some good academies that have so much opportunity and potential to change the community. And in a very small way, eventually change parts of the world right with these things and you know so people don't get it they don't get it but what are you seeing that is broken the most right within these other schools when you're coaching and doing evaluations i mean that's a that's a great question um very very similar traits and in, in most of the studios that i visit um a lot of it is leadership from the top like 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 the staff being held accountable to make sure that it is the cleanest place that anybody's going to visit that when people walk through the door um, it's the most positive place that, that people will visit in their day. Like pe urgency, urgency in their team to solve problems, to be there, to help, you know, I mean, little things though, like greeting people at the door, getting down and tying a kid's belt, making sure the, the standard, you know, like, like if, if a kid's t-shirt under their uniform is, is untucked, you know, and you let that pass, that's breaking your culture. And so have yeah. teaching teaching these martial artists and these instructors to have eyes for that and to hold those down. I think, I think, as martial artists, like we want to we, we want to help people. We want to save people a lot of times, right? And we don't want to upset anyone. And so we try to be everything to everyone, and we don't want to ruffle feathers or cause any friction. And so you know, I, I just see that instructors just don't hold students accountable to exactly how they bow, exactly their energy level and effort on the mat. You know, like on an yeah. instructor's side of things, you have like like a drill I did with a team this weekend was, tell me what a perfect bow looks like. What is a perfect mm -hmm. bow? Going down, halfway, one second beat, back up. It's not this head nod thing. You know, it's a perfect bow. Now, if you know that's a perfect bow, do you hold every single person you're building that bows on that mat to that standard? Or do you overlook it, right? And, when the parents walk in with their kid, what's the perfect way for a parent to walk through the doors, right? Do you teach the kid how to greet the person at the front, right? Do you teach the kid to look the instructor in the eye and say, hey, nice to see you, Sensei Cox, right? Do, mm -hmm. do you, because I, I went up to a child, introduced myself to the studio, they didn't know me, and I'm, I'm shaking the mom's hand, I'm looking her in the eyes and telling her who I am, and I'm starting to introduce myself to the child, and the mother's like, hey, look him in the eyes, tell him your name. So the mom's trying to teach the kid how to have a proper greeting, you know? So that's something that we should also be teaching in our academies as well and, and, and making sure kids, every time they talk to you, they look you in the eye, you know? So when it comes to the, the structure of the martial arts environment, like going back to having a very rigid rigid standard when people walk the door, know what every, what is the protocol if somebody's late? And if they're late more than a few minutes, is it okay that they join the class or not, right? Yeah. What are the uniform protocols? You know, is the belt tied properly? If not, do you make sure that it's tied properly, right? So that's that's on the instructor side of things. On the business side of things, um, I don't think martial artists understand the value of a handshake, getting out in your community and, and farming your community. And so we've relied on digital for the last 10 years or so, so heavily that right now that it's not as effective. The cost per lead is so high that we forgot how to go out there and do more like grassroots marketing community events. And literally the one of the PDs I was working this weekend, I said, your, your goal over the next week, I want you to shake a hundred hands. If you go out and introduce yourself to a hundred people and shake a hundred hands and introduce yourself and what you do, how many do you think would say more than thank you and start having a conversation about martial arts with you? He was like, well, probably 20 or 30. All right, great. 20 or 30 new people you just met. How many of those do you think maybe you could give your digital business card, collect their name and phone number, and now you have a lead that you can follow up on? He's like, every one of those. All right, well, that's 20 or 30 leads every single week just by shaking a hand. And I think I think we've gotten so comfortable sitting behind the computer. Think like a politician. How does a politician get known? You know, shaking hands and kissing babies is what they say, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's what we need to do as business owners and our staff needs to be taught to go out in our community and extrovert and, and become known. And I think... I think I think we need to get better at that. And that's just one thing I've been coaching a lot of these program directors and business owners on is just get out in the community, get known, like, like integrate yourself in the community. We need to do a better job there. I agree. Those are great topics, man. Heck, uh, 
I, I've even uh, mellowed out a little bit on some of those things or not been as active. So I buckle down myself, you know, if you shook, if you shook, shook a hundred hands every week. Yeah. How many do you think you actually could get to walk through your doors that week? Yeah. Right, or at right, least yeah. show some interest, right? I guarantee yeah. you, you could as passionate as you are about this. I mean, people will see that fire, that passion, and they're going to want to be closer to you. I mean, you probably could get 10 or 15, 20. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I'm interested. You know, simple old school, right? Just look in their eyes, shake their hand, build a relationship because it's all about connections and relationships. And even if something didn't happen, something did happen. In other words, you know, like we have uh, cold, warm and hot leads. Well, there was still a connection and maybe they tell someone else or maybe six months or six years later, they remember something, you know, so those things are there. Yeah. And I the know best Aaron leads, Hensley, go the ahead. best leads yeah. are, are the warmer leads. And when I say warm, it's, it's ones that you've gone out and you've looked them in the eyes yeah. and you've introduced yourself, you know, whether it be at a promotional table, like a community event, right. A referral from one of your current members, right. Who are raving about what you do. There, there's connection there. Like you're talking about, those are the best leads. You know, if somebody's scrolling through Facebook. Oh, I see this. It looks cool. I click the button. They're not really committed to, to your brand and what you're all about. I think we all need to get back to that grassroots community-based marketing. There's a lot the of way I built my first business, man. The way I built my first studio, me and my buddy, Zach, uh, we were, at, I would do a promotional table no, anywhere, anywhere. You tell yeah. me, I did a promotional table at a Goodwill. Probably yeah. not the best place to do it, but it was an <laughs> opportunity and I did it. You know, we would fly our cars. We would go to uh, the baseball field during baseball games and just get out there and meet people. And him and I in the first year built built our studio just by that. It cost us really pretty much zero money, but it was all sweat equity and it paid off. You know, and I think I yeah, think we yeah. all get back to that. Yeah. And, and then and then go back to the value, James. Like, okay, we do that, and then we have to charge a premium for our service and have to deliver on that premium. And if we can do those things, then there's no reason any of us can't make career a career living and own a true business. If we make that our, our, our focus in our studios yeah. and help more people. Now you're opening another location, you know, and, and you're, you're, you're instead of 200 students, you got 400. I mean, just, just whatever. So you're able to help more people. Yeah, definitely feel uh, like uh, I'm serving God's purpose through this, you know, like helping yeah. people. I went to um, this has been years ago. I think it was 2017. I went to I, I'm from Brunswick, Georgia. It's about an hour north of Jacksonville, Florida. So by default, by geography, I became a Jaguars fan. And it's, it's kind of a tough gig. But uh, I was sitting at a Jaguars playoff game. I think they played the Bills and I got playoff tickets. And, you know, the, the stadium was packed. It was probably 80, 90, 100,000 people, something like that. Right. And uh, something was like, like, God just kind of touched me in the shoulder and said, look around. Right. And it made me realize, like, you know what? I bet you through martial arts, I've affected enough people in a positive way that I probably could fill up the stadium yeah. with the impact that I've had in my community through not only martial arts classes at our studio, but school talks at elementary schools, being in our neighborhoods and our communities, making that contact and that touch, you know, not just a student, but their parent, the grandparent. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I bet you I could fill up the stadium with the people I've impacted because of the martial arts and how powerful is that who yeah who has that opportunity in front of them a lot of people have jobs and careers where nobody knows their name they don't make a real impact you know they don't get that opportunity and we have a platform we have a stage where we truly have an opportunity like you said to change the world for what mm -hmm. we do right and that should be our mission our mission should be to change yeah. the world yeah you could fill some stadiums man if you know, there was a way to do like a reunion of the people that you've impacted. You know, oh my gosh, it would be yeah, crazy. That would be amazing. I know Aaron Hensley did a speech recently and he talks about is it called it 5% or 3%, but it's basically the little details as you were talking about the kid tucking the shirt in, you know, the correct way to bow. I taught demo team class on Friday. We spent probably more time than necessary on feet together set. But then my point was, if you can make this a thousand percent, the absolute, let's imagine you're trying to win a million dollar prize, the world championship title for the best feet together set. How good can that be? And now we're done with that. Let's move on to this first front stance. How amazing can we make this? Let's do one move as if it's your life depends on it. Everything is about that one front stance. Okay, now let's do it. And it's one move at a time so that you, you, you 
you know, everything is corrected. You're, you're detail oriented. You get all the little things right. Cause you know, we see it all the time in martial arts on the physical side, man, that guy has some good punches, but his kicks are no good. Oh, that kick was good, but this one had no chamber, you know, details, details, details within your school. I went to some of the old martial arts schools where it was, it was cool to smell like bare feet and sweat to have everything duct taped. There was one school, an MMA school, had a boxing ring, the most disgusting thing ever. And they were proud if, you know, they were sparring full contact and somebody, um, you know, bled, there was blood on the mat. They would initial it with a marker on canvas, like a prize. <laughs> How sick and disgusting, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we have a different image, a different day. And, you know, those, those first impressions, the first impressions matter. Yeah, they do. Yeah, those, yeah, those are the things that Absolutely. are happening. Wait, listen, listen. And, and like, you know, I, I went into, I believe it was a Chipotle. It's been a couple months ago. And it was later at night after classes. And I was hungry. You know, my wife and I go. And, you know, we're about to order. I, I ask her if she'll order for me. I'm going to go use the restroom. I went to the restroom. And it was so disgusting. I mean, like worse than a convenience store restroom, you know. I, I came out. I said, we're, we're not eating here. Let's go. Because I don't know. What does the kitchen look like? If the bathroom looks like that, what does the kitchen look like? You know, and so I left, you know, and and, and people, people, people notice, especially your new prospects coming in the door. They notice everything, all the little things that you've kind of gotten blinders on now because you're there every single day. They, they pick up on those things. And so, like you said, the details matter, whether it be in business, the details matter, whether it be on our martial arts floor, the details matter. And personally, right, our personal discipline, the details matter. Mm-hmm. And so that, that that's that's what we should be teaching our team. That should be the the message to our team. Uh, and, and you're talking about the 95.5 is what Aaron, Aaron preaches, the 95.5. What is the 5% that we're missing that we can control, that we can improve on a, da- a daily level? And and so, you know, you James, like you said, man, you walk into a, stu- a studio, a new studio, you see it instantly. It stands out like a sore thumb, you know, but our yeah. staff don't see it because they're they're in the weeds day in and day out. And they can't see the forest due to the trees, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and as a coach, as a coach, that's what that's what a coach is there for. They're there to, to spot your leaks and to speed up your your success, right? That's really what they're there for. And, and I need a coach. You need a coach. Everyone needs someone that puts pressure on them. Um, and it's the same same reason. Accountability is is really what you're looking for, whether it be martial arts or have any kind of coach or weightlifting coach or whatever. You're looking for accountability and to speed up the process. Um, And that's what we should be selling in our martial arts academies, by the way, is that accountability as well. I pay my coach, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year to coach me, to hold me accountable, to make sure I'm at the highest level I can be at. You know, that martial arts lessons are pennies on the dollar compared to that. You know, but I pay the coach a high value because I know he's going to hold me to a higher standard. And Aaron is my coach. He's going to hold me to a higher standard and expect more out of me. And I don't want to disappoint him, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's no different than relationship with a student and a martial arts instructor. Right. So this kind of like full circle we're talking about having standards, holding everyone accountable and your team, your staff. It's like your family and it's honestly like your kids. You know, and you should really pour into them like they are your children, you know, you, you, you know, whether it be martial arts or whether it be, hey, you know what? I have 41 experience, uh, 41 years of experience in life. I've been married, been divorced, had kids. I can I can guide and help my team through life lessons, not just martial arts lessons. Right. I can be their coach, their personal development coach and spot their leaks. And um, which is pretty cool. Right. I mean, like if you had a corporate job you probably don't have anybody in your quarter really looking after you like that. that that's something right. that we can offer as, as martial arts business professionals to our team is we can offer them that, that personal connection that they're not going to get in any other field. Um, you know, if one of my team members has a baby, you know, I'm going to be there for them. If they're getting married, I'm probably going to be at the wedding. You know, I know you do the same thing with your team, James, you, know, you walk in like, like they, they need to handle what, what they can handle that day. You know, I, I went in my bathroom earlier. To be honest with you, I went in my bathroom earlier. There was no toilet paper in the bathroom roll. You know, guess what? That's a lesson for my team today. Mm-hmm. That's a huge lesson. Yeah. You know, what if I was a new prospect going in there and how awkward that may be? You know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so yes, sir. I hope, hope that kind of kind of ties everything together. But I, I just feel like we have such a platform that we get to change lives. We undercharge what we do. 
We get to be a personal life's coach for every single person that walks in our building, including our team. And uh, man, what a blessing that is, right? I like that everyone needs a coach. And, you know, that's, it seems like that's preached on more today, even the best in the world who still have mentors and coaches, because how are you going to get better? You know, I mean, you're not right. It's like getting to a black button. You think you're done. Uh, kind of just starting. I mean, you've done an amazing thing, but there's so much more to understand, to be able to apply. And how about focus even on another area? You've been, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I tell my team members too, like, I, you know, I know that my, my goal, my role as a, as a business leader and as a coach is to make sure that no one can outgrow me that that's under my you know, uh, under my network you know like like I have to keep up my personal development and be constantly learning and growing so that way they don't outgrow me and if they ever do they need to find a, a new mentor you know and and honestly even my team members here you know I tell them because you know a lot of times your staff or your instructors say you know I don't know if I want to do this the rest of my life I even thought that do I want to teach martial arts the rest of my life and I'm like you know, hey, I don't even know what I want to do the rest of my life. Right. Like, so you don't feel like you gotta know what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. Make the impact as high as you can right now while you're doing this. And if my team ever finds a new opportunity or a new passion they want to pursue, you know, I'm gonna be there to back them up and help them. And I would never resent one of these guys for that. And I tell I have a 20 year old instructor, you know, and I'm like, man, I don't expect you to do this the rest of your life. If you find some other passion, something you want to pursue, I'm gonna be there coaching along the way and support you no matter what, you know? Um, so, so I think, especially if you have young team members, they think that way, you know, Oh, do I want to do this forever? And then James, you probably same thing, man. Like you don't know what you want to do when you grow up. Do you? Right, right. you don't want, what, you don't what am what I going to be first. when I grow up? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know? So I think while we have that opportunity with these guys in our building, you know, we just have to lift them up and we have to coach them the best we can. So that way we've made a true impact in their life, you know, and, and they'll never forget, you know, how you improve their, their life on this planet. Yeah. We could all embrace, embrace those moments, uh, you know, get return on your own investment and man, live life to the fullest at that time. You know, they say, uh, the present is a gift. That's the moment that we have right now because we can't go back. We can't go forward. So, you know, let's do this now, right? Whatever that this may be, because everything changes and go to the next moment. Yes, sir. And one, one thing, too, that I'm really trying to work on, on my staff is it, it, trying to teach them money management and financial literacy um, because because their money problem is my problem. Right. I mean, I, I can't pay them what they're worth. Right. I wish I could pay them so much more. Um, so I've got to teach them how to be smart with their money. And I've got to be an example of that for them. And then really have been working on, on recently teaching them how to how to store their money so that way they can put it in an area that's going to serve them for the rest of their life. And so that's been a big, a big point of my staff development training right now is to get them on the same page with me of like, Hey, here's, here's where we're going together. You know, let, let's make investments together. You know, let's be business partners together in the future. Like let's think long-term just, and it starts with, with money management with your team. If you're not teaching your team how to manage their money properly, that is one area I think we all probably could do a better job in when we when we do staff training. If, if you know how, how to get, get money, how to store money, how to invest money, well, then that's really what is, is sorely needed in our culture. It's not taught at school. And that's an opportunity, again, as, as a small business leader that you can teach your team on how to be successful with their with their money. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do that myself. Thanks for the, the, for the reminder. Yeah, that's important. So what else you got going on? What's what's happening in, in life and uh, upcoming? Well, I mean, just continuing to grow my businesses. I'm really trying to grow in the, in the coaching field. Um, it's just a kind of a new venture for me. I mean, I've always just kind of done my own thing. And, and sometimes a little bit of imposter syndrome, like, like who am I to coach someone else? But, you know, I've had some success with it. You know, I've been coaching martial arts schools for the last three months. Um, and every every studio that I've gone into and I've coached has had a hockey stick month immediately after working with me. I mean, I had um, a small studio, 60 members, uh, about 30 miles north of where I'm living right now. I went and introduced myself to him and his wife. Um, and I know martial artists, man, they think you're full of, of crap unless they really, they know you're a real martial artist. And so I actually took some of his classes, went in there and sparred with him and kicked his butt. And then he started listening to me yeah. and we dove mm -hmm. into his numbers. And I'm like, hey, I, th I think I can help you, you know. And uh, he he was averaging only about ten to twelve thousand dollars a month max 
And in the first four weeks of working with me, he'd had a $52,000 a month. Nice. Um, another, another, another one out of Ohio I worked with averaging around 20,000 a month at the first four weeks of work with me, they had a month, I think they did $41,000 last month, mm. you know? And so for me personally, like growing that side of the, of the business is, is kind of what I'm going to be focused on and continue to grow my team and expand my team yeah. in my martial arts studio. And that means that school is making more money. So that school is paying its employees better. You know, that school is getting more new students. It's upgrading. Its and listen, in both, in both those situations, the owners had never even taken a paycheck. Yeah. You know, and, and yes, yes. And, um, and, and got them on payroll. No, no, no. You're the first one to get paid, not the last one. You know, yeah. and uh, and just just coach them in that area again. It's that's kind of like money management, financial literacy. Yeah. Like you should get paid first. Yeah. You know how happy is a starving artist? How really happy is a starving artist? You know, no, so they're, they're scared. They're yeah. scared and fearful every single day. You know, that's what I have going on. I'm just trying to grow grow that side of the business, continuing my 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 journey through this life, figuring things out. You know, um, my wife and I are, are trying for another kid. So hopefully you'll be hearing about, about that soon. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Cool. Um, like I said, we, we just started homeschooling our kids recently. So figuring that whole game out and continuing to, to pour into our children over this next year is, is, is really our focus. Yeah. Lots of opportunities, you know, it's not lots going on. It's lots of opportunities. Cool, man. How about we do some real quick kind of rapid fire, like just some short, simple answers right off the, the hip there. So, um, yeah. Uh, best martial arts style. <laughs> there is no best martial arts style. There are best martial artists, right? Uh, and most, most, most awesome martial artists now are multi-styled versed anyway. You know, you, you have me personally, you know, it was started in Tong Sudo. So I'm a good kicker, but I boxed for a long time. That kind of led into kickboxing. I'm a blue belt in jujitsu, so truly kind of a mixed martial artist. Um, so I, I don't think there is one truly perfect style. It's it's the it's the artist themselves, right? Oh, and yeah. it's just their constant pursuit of becoming a better person through martial arts. Uh, uh, best, best age to start, start martial arts. arts. I think the younger the better. Um, you know, e even to this day, my favorite class, if I just jump on the mat to teach, would be like a five to seven year old class. I love the, those kids because. They're not apathetic at all. I mean, they're like, okay, you want me to run through that brick wall? Yes, sir. Boom. Don't yeah. run through the brick wall. You know, I mean, they were so, so excited to do whatever you challenge them with. Um, so honestly, I think everyone should get their kids started in martial arts at a young age. I would say, you know, four or five years old, perfect time to get started in martial arts. Good, good. Uh, best martial arts technique. I know you've here. Well, what's, what's the one technique I should know? Everybody wants the yesterday microwave world you know if i had to know one technique to save my life what would it be man that's a good question man good question i think honestly keep it simple i think having number one it starts with distance management having a good foundation a good base you know a good stance you better have that and then a solid jab man yeah a solid jab yeah it starts with your foundation if you don't know how to stand and, stance uh... Distance management and just having a really strong lead hand. I mean, that, that'll help you in self-defense. That'll help you in combat and fighting. Yeah, no, it really starts there. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, well, good stuff, Travis. We can close with anything you want to say, uh, tips, pointers, words of wisdom for the audience. I don't, gratitude, be grateful. Wake up every day, be grateful, yeah. right? We all have problems. We all have our situations, right? We have our challenges, but man, don't we have it good? Yes, sir. Yeah. Getting a little emotional should, about that, you know, but um, I lost my son. He was 25 years old back in 2017. Mm -hmm. You don't wake up thinking you're about to lose your, your son. Right. So, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. I can't, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that you, you just never know. So that's, that's powerful on counting the blessings, the silver linings that we did wake up. You know, our child woke up, your spouse woke up, your parent woke up. You didn't get a call in the middle of the night, you know? Yeah, start start every day with gratitude. It'll change your life. Yeah, good stuff, man. Well, Travis, I really appreciate it. Let's all be let's all be grateful. The attitude of gratitude. And uh, you guys, uh, where, where can we find you best? 
check us out on Rise USA. That's our coaching coaching group. So if, if you're a membership based business or really, really any small business owner that wants a little coaching, little accountability, someone to spot your leaks, uh, check us out on Rise USA. You can check through Facebook or Instagram. Uh, also on my social media, you know, Travis Thornton, you can you can look me up there. Um, that'd probably be best. Yes, sir. Cool. All right, bro. Well, you guys do it. Find them. I mean, um, I definitely give you all the uh, recommendation and, you know, trust every piece of advice that, that you have to offer. So good luck and uh, continue. And, uh, and I'll talk to you soon. And everyone else, well, that's episode 60. So you need to go back and watch all 59 to this one and check out these episodes and share them and uh, follow my YouTube page, James Cox Martial Arts. Thanks, Travis. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir.